Thank you, uh, Chair Levine, for your leadership, and uh, thank you, Parks Commissioner uh, Silver. In 2014, I came to this budget hearing and noted that the East River Esplanade was literally falling into the river, and that if we let it fall into the river, it would be $430 million to rebuild it, or it would cost us $115 million not to make it as great as the west side, and I do demand that we make the East River Esplanade better than the west side, uh, but just that it would take $115 million to shore it up. Uh, in that year, we were able to secure $35 million. Uh, we have finished phase one and two of that $35 million, and we now Instead of 115 million, which I asked for previously, we are now requesting 169 million dollars to keep that work on track. And so, uh, Commissioner Silver, I want to thank your team for their great work, and uh, ask if you will continue to fund the uh, shoring up of the East River Esplanade so that it does not fall into the river. Well, all I can say is that uh, we do agree with you, that uh, we're very pleased. Uh, actually, we have 42 million from phase one and two that went into stabilizing the Esplanade, and we recognize that more work, work needs to be done. Uh, and we'll continue to have conversations with the administration about getting additional capital dollars to improve the Esplanade. And, and thank you. And this is uh, an issue of importance to Council District uh, 5, as well as my, my neighbor to the north. We actually split the Esplanade, which runs from 60th to uh, 125th Street. And a lot of the work that we've already secured has been benefiting both the Upper East Side and East Harlem. So again, thank you for the work. Uh, on a uh, separate note, uh, the east side, uh, my council district, District 5, actually ranks fourth from the last uh, for open space. And so we're looking for it anywhere we can. I want to thank you for opening 2,000 square feet and doing a ribbon cutting, and the community is still excited about it because we now have peer space that can be used as park space. Uh, however, we have about 50,000 square feet, an acre and a quarter, uh, that's under the Queensboro Bridge. It's called Queensboro Oval. And in my lifetime, I, I'd never actually been able to be there because uh, there has been a private lease for the entire park uh, for the better part of 40 years. And uh, I, even on a city council member's salary, I can't afford the 180 to $225 an hour to play tennis there. I've asked other folks from Parks Department if they would play tennis with me there, but none of us seem to be able to, 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 to part with that uh, $180 to play in. And so I understand that certain members of the public may have $180 uh, to play tennis there, but they certainly don't live in my district. Uh, uh, and uh, they don't live in the surrounding area because I haven't actually heard from anyone in my community other than asking to return the space. And so we've worked with Community Board 8 for the better part of my entire first term. We've passed, we've had 14 meetings, we've passed four resolutions. Uh, the borough president, our congress member, our state senator, uh, and, and I and our assembly member have all asked to please not renew the lease and to open it back to the public. I, for one, am willing to put capital funds, but can we please deprivatize a park in the city and uh, add public space and a brand new public park? For our clarification purposes, uh, the space underneath the Queensboro Bridge is a Department of Transportation uh, property. Uh, a lot of people affectionately call it a park, but actually is a Department of Transportation property which is being used as a concession. Uh, as but you before know that, we that it, was, it was a park before it was a concession because we've had people at community board meetings testify that they played softball there, that they ran on a track there. So it has historically been used for parks purposes and even now is being licensed through parks. It's being licensed through parks, but uh, it is a property, it's a city owned property, but it's now under the jurisdiction of a Department of Transportation. I can't answer what happened prior to the concession. It's been there, I'm told, some 30, 40 years. But as you know, going forward, uh, we uh, have met with many stakeholders, including uh, our elected officials. We have both a short-term and a long-term plan. The short-term uh, is to continue, uh, make a recommendation to continue the lease on a year-to-year -year basis while we explore some of the long-term options. We have not come up with a determination yet of what that long-term long -term option is, but we'll continue those conversations with both you, your colleagues, elected officials, as well as other stakeholders uh, until we can come up with a resolution. But for the time being, we are recommending, uh, which we did share with the community when we met with them, uh, depending on how long the conversation would occur, 
that we would have to uh, extend that license agreement until we come to a long-term solution. I think there's an overwhelming concern, at least by me as Chair of Governmental Operations, having overseen uh, Rivington and now Water's Edge and others, anytime we see a private vendor who's paying, I believe, just over $2 million for an acre and a, half and a quarter of city space, which is far below market, and making several million dollars a year and not having to compete against a free market or compete against other providers. We, we have similar arrangements, not quite with groups like Asphalt Green, where over 40,000 children play, but we're not seeing anywhere near the number of people there, and we're not seeing access to this space for low-income families and uh, the community as a whole. So I guess uh, the concern from myself, all the elected officials, and the community board is just that uh, allowing it to lapse into yearly renewals is not responding to the community. And, and I believe that I, I work for the voters, and parks should also be working for the residents of the community. Uh, we continue to listen to stakeholders on both sides of the issue, those that would like it to continue and those that would like it to uh, somehow become a, a open space. As I stated, we have both a short-term recommendation as we explore some of the long-term options, and that is the process that we're continuing. Um, but we're always willing to sit down to talk to anyone that wants to talk about this further, uh, but that is what we shared uh, with the community, uh, with the elected officials, uh, but we don't have a final recommendation of what the long-term use should be. I, I guess the, the Last piece, and I believe the Riverside Clay Park Tennis Association is in uh, Council Member Levine's uh, district, but that's a tremendous model where parks property with clay courts on it is maintained by the Riverside Park Conservancy and this sub entity. And we've got these great clay parks, and if we could replicate that model and have work with them to be custodians of this, we could tomorrow. Uh, cancel the license and still have a tennis use there, uh, but we could replicate the success that you've had on Riverside. So once again, we're slightly envious of the west side on the east side and hope for uh, similar services. Well, you don't have to be envious of me on that one because those are in Councilmember Rosenthal's district. <laughs> but the, the truth is that we do have a model for a public run tennis court. And I don't think that Councilmember Kalis is against tennis. I gather he has a pretty good game. But that under the public managed model, it's, it's a $100 annual fee, and thank you for reducing that. Uh, that's certainly increased usage. There's clearly a budgetary impact if it's going to be a publicly run entity with those lower fees. But I think what you heard Councilmember Kalis say, and what I would echo, is that let's have the conversation about what the budget would need to be on the capital side, probably there's millions of dollars of backlog needs there. And then on the operating side, um, and ultimately I would argue that it's, there's a public benefit served by that investment. And I would, I would add my voice to, to the council members and, and, and pushing for those kind of creative solutions uh, for public access and public space, uh, no matter what agency has jurisdiction.